Asteroids are kind of like the fossil records of the formation of our solar system. But the story of asteroids didn't begin with a desire to understand the formation of the solar system so much as it began with a search for Planet X. Giuseppe Piazzi was an astronomer looking for Planet X, and from January to February of 1801, he noticed that there was, in fact, an object that was moving among the background stars. This was not, however, a planet so much as it appeared to be kind of like a star, so Piazzi thought that maybe this was a comet. Nevertheless, he was credited with discovering Ceres. At the time, it was considered to be a planet at exactly 2.8 AU between Mars and Jupiter. Okay, so fine, there's a tiny planet there, except for one problem. It wasn't just Ceres. There were other planets, or at least these other objects that were found, all throughout the 1800s. It quickly became apparent that these were not really planets, but a new class of object called asteroids. Asteroids simply mean star-like, and these are just objects that move like planets, but are otherwise identical to the background stars. So asteroids tend to be the small bodies that are mostly rocky or metallic, and they orbit the sun out to Jupiter. Now, this is just a few of the objects that are in the main asteroid belt. Uh, here are some of the rest. We have discovered about a quarter of a million asteroids, and we expect to be finding more as time goes on. Now, if you look at this main belt of asteroids, it's really tempting to assume that they're really crowded together, just like we see in science fiction films. But the reality is that each and every one of those dots that you see here are actually several million kilometers apart. So what you would see is not so much this, but rather this. It's just like looking at the sky from Earth. If you happen to live on an asteroid, Maybe you'd get lucky and catch a star moving among the background stars, but that would just be the nearest asteroid. Now, asteroids are characterized by groups, families, and types. So let's talk about groups first. These are all objects that have similar orbits, but they may have different compositions within the orbits. So the different groups here are color-coded, uh, so they're named after the first member of that group that was discovered. So for example, the inner reds are Atens, the inner greens are Apollo, and the inner blues are Armors. The main belt are the white asteroids, and then you have an outer blue group called the Hildas. And these green objects out here are the Trojan asteroids. They're being held in place by a gravitational balance between Jupiter and the Sun, so they're always kind of stuck there, and they just all orbit the Sun. Now, it's tempting to think that all of these asteroids are just orbiting in the same plane as the Earth and the other planets, but in fact, all of these asteroids have their own individual inclinations. So some of them are coming in from above, others from below. But if we mathematically flatten all of the orbits of these asteroids, these gaps emerge. These gaps are called Kirkwood gaps, and they're due to orbital resonances with Jupiter. For example, if there's an asteroid in the first gap at two and a half astronomical units, then for every three orbits around the Sun that asteroid makes, Jupiter makes one orbit. That results in a routine gravitational tug on that asteroid that gently pulls it out of that gap and clears the space in between. And if this looks familiar, well, it should. We see gaps like this in Saturn's rings due to orbital resonances of ring particles with moons orbiting outside of the ring system. Asteroids are also characterized by families, and families are formed in collisions. So they're really just the debris of collisions of asteroids, which happened an awful lot during the early solar system. And as a result, family members are going to have similar orbits, colors, and composition. Now, some of the largest families can have several thousand members, but they're all spread out in a kind of a ring system around the sun. Think of it this way. A family is initially formed in a collision, so that debris is going to orbit the sun. But because each object in the debris field has its own distance from the sun, each object is going to follow its own Keplerian orbit. That means that objects that are closer to the sun are going to have shorter periods, while objects farther from the sun are going to have longer periods. The result is that the objects of the family spread out, forming a kind of a ring system around the sun. So families don't really orbit together in the same place. Rather, they spread out, and the way we define families are not by where they're located in their orbits, but by their colors and compositions. And it's the compositions of asteroids that let us define 
asteroid types. Stony type asteroids are kind of what we're most familiar with. These are the ones that orbit closer to Mars. But the most common type of asteroid are carbonaceous asteroids. Now, both the stony and the carbonaceous asteroids are what we call primitive. And what that means is that these objects really have not changed very much from when they initially formed. However, metallic asteroids are differentiated, and that's what really sets these types apart from the stony and the carbonaceous type. Now, here's how that can happen. Imagine we have a planetesimal in the early solar system, and planetesimals get hit a lot, and that results in the planetesimal heating up. Now, one of two things can happen to a planetesimal that's heated up. Uh, the first is that it just cools back to its original state, and it's basically the same as it was before the impacts. On the other hand, it could get so hot during the impacts that it melts, and that allows differentiation to take place. In either case, additional impacts will take place, and that will shatter those planetesimals, producing the types of asteroids that we see today. So let's take a look at the two most dominant players of the asteroid belt. The first is Ceres, and it was at first thought to be a planet, then thought to be an asteroid. Now it's thought to be a dwarf planet. And the reason for its dwarf planet characterization is because it is so massive. It has pulled itself into a round shape. It was also visited by the Dawn spacecraft ever since 2015, and it's still there today. And one thing we notice about Ceres is that there are no giant impacts. It's very much similar in texture to the lunar highlands. Here's a sequence of images uh, taken by the Dawn spacecraft, and it shows the planet making a single rotation. You notice how there are no dark Maria region on the planet like we find on the moon. Now, perhaps the most striking feature of Ceres are these two bright spots inside the crater that's kind of at the one o'clock position on your screen. This crater is called Okotter Crater, and the bright spots in them are the result of salty, briny water that erupted or surged through cryovolcanoes. So when the water was exposed to the vacuum of space, it instantly sublimated and deposited these bright, highly reflective salts onto the surface. It raises the question of whether or not cryovolcanism may still be active on Ceres. And some of the most compelling evidence of cryovolcanism is this object right here. This is called Ahuna Mons. Here's a side view of it. And this is a very tall mountain. This is about twice the height of Mount Everest on Earth. And this is believed to be a protrusion of water ice surging from deep inside Ceres' mantle. So the mantle is going to be mainly water and ice with perhaps a rocky interior. Now to put Ceres into perspective, here it is stacked up against the Earth and the Moon. And if we take a closer look, we can now look at the most massive asteroid in the solar system, Vesta. Vesta was visited by the Dawn spacecraft, and it's covered in basalts. And basalts are the result of volcanoes, so this tells us that Vesta was once volcanically active. And not only that, but Vesta is not quite round. It has kind of a squishy shape to it. You can even see these compression grooves uh, that look like something had smacked into it from the probably from the south. So Vesta and Ceres are probably not typical asteroids. Uh, we already know that Ceres is a dwarf planet, but it's also very wet and undifferentiated. So in that respect, it kind of reminds us of those carbonaceous C-type asteroids, except it's really, really, really huge. And Vesta is neither a metallic or a stony asteroid, but rather it's the planetesimal that has yet to be shattered into such asteroids. So Vesta really is kind of like a protoplanet. And Vesta and Ceres are not the only asteroids that we have either visited or flown past with spacecraft. Uh, here's a look at some of the others. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this asteroid here, Ida, has its own moon called Dactyl. And another well-known asteroid is Eros. Eros is uh, an asteroid that was visited by the near Shoemaker spacecraft in 2001. It has a kind of a lumpy shape to it, and this tells us that Eros was probably put together by a couple of objects that may have collided or merged. 
By the way, if you're a fan of the Expanse, this is the same Eros that forms the Eros station in the asteroid belt. Speaking of combined objects, uh, this little guy here, this object called Itakawa, was visited by the Hayabusa spacecraft, and at just 350 meters, it has no impact craters and has two lobes with different densities. That tells us that this is really not one object or even two, but rather several objects kind of clustered together in a kind of a rubble pile. Now, what makes Itakawa really interesting is the fact that it is in an Earth-crossing orbit. That makes it a potentially hazardous asteroid, or PAH. So here is a plot again of the known asteroids, uh, but if we get rid of all the belt asteroids and only put in the objects that have the potential of coming close to Earth, we get all of these. A near-Earth object is any asteroid or comet whose orbit is close enough to Earth. Uh, that is to say, comes within about 1.3 AU of the Sun. If the object in question is an asteroid, it's called a near-Earth asteroid, or NEA. And if its orbit crosses Earth and is greater than 140 meters across, it's called a potentially hazardous asteroid, or PHA. Since the 1990s, the Space Guard Survey has tracked 18,000 near-Earth asteroids. And of the 18,000, about 8,154 of them are what can be considered to be local threats or city killers. If one of these objects were to hit a major city or a metropolitan area, it would be like setting off several nuclear weapons. On the other hand, an object at a kilometer or greater in diameter would be considered a global threat. These objects, should they hit the Earth, would kick up enough water and dust into the atmosphere to basically put us into a nuclear winter, and that would result in the extinction of several species of life on Earth, probably including humans. But most of these near-Earth asteroids end up in one of two situations. Either they impact somewhere on one of the terrestrial planets, or perhaps the Sun, or they swing close enough to a planet that they get ejected from the inner solar system. But sometimes these objects get really close. For example, this object, 2014 AA, passed us by on January 2nd of 2014. As a matter of fact, that's how this object was discovered. We saw it going past Earth, and we realized how close it had come after the fact. But sometimes objects do hit Earth. This is the famous meteorite that zorched through the skies of Chelyabinsk, Russia. This object created a shockwave that sent a lot of people to the hospital. This is what was picked up out of a nearby lake. This is a giant stony meteorite, and it's much smaller than the original 20 meters, but still you wouldn't want something like this landing directly onto a city. Oh, by the way, that same day, another object passed inside the geosynchronous ring of Earth. So how did we know about this asteroid when we didn't even see the Chelyabinsk meteor coming? First of all, the Chelyabinsk meteor was in a completely different orbit than 2012 DA14. So we weren't even looking for it. But a second reason is because the Chelyabinsk meteor came in from the sun. And that means that we can't just look in the sky toward the direction of the sun and expect to find a meteor heading toward us. And in fact, that's how we discover most asteroids. They often come in from the direction of the sun. And once we see which way they're going, we work it backward to find out where they came from. And that's how we work out their orbits. Now, when an object burns through the atmosphere the way the Chelyabinsk meteor did, it gets very bright. And these super bright asteroids are called bolides. It's basically just an extremely bright meteor, and it often goes by the nickname of a fireball. And fireball events, or these bolide events, have been tracked since 1988, and we've had quite a few of them. But bear in mind, these are just the ones that we've seen. Oftentimes, these events will occur over the ocean, and if there is not a ship or an airplane around, there's no one out there to see it. So the Chelyabinsk meteor was actually the most powerful bolide event, and it released about a half a megaton of TNT. But so far, the greatest threat that we do face to a major planet-killing asteroid is really not that huge a threat at all. This is the orbit of 410777, and it has a 0.14% chance of impact in 2185. 
To put it another way, it has a 99.86% chance it'll miss Earth. Now, I would rather have better odds than that, but hey, if I happen to be alive in 2185 and I am taken out by this asteroid, I'm going to call that one a win. Still, about a quarter of all near-Earth asteroids should hit the Earth within the next 100 million years. So if we have an impact like that, then we're talking about the energy of several million thermonuclear bombs. So the big question is, could we defend ourselves? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on knowing when it's going to impact. Obviously, the more lead time, the better. It's going to depend on what exactly is coming toward us. I mean, are we dealing with a rubble pile or a giant hunk of metal? What about our capabilities? Can we develop the technologies necessary to take it out? And last but not least would be our willingness to do anything about it. You never know. Now, the one thing about Earth is that it's always moving around the sun. So we do present a moving target for an incoming asteroid. And as a matter of fact, Earth moves through its own diameter in just seven minutes. So if we could somehow speed up or slow down an asteroid such that it's seven minutes early or late, then we are in the clear. So how do you do that? Well, you could nuke it, but it's not the best idea namely because you would turn one big object into smaller objects. Now, if the object in question is coming really close to Earth and we have a very short window of opportunity to do anything about it, then yeah, this is the way to go. We'd be turning a planet killer into a bunch of city killers, but hey, what are you going to do? On the other hand, if we have enough lead time, we could just send a spacecraft to crash into the asteroid. This is known as a kinetic impact, and the idea is that the object traveling to the asteroid has kinetic energy. If it imparts that kinetic energy onto the asteroid, it could deflect the asteroid off course. But if we had decades to work with, then we could set up a gravity tractor. And the idea is simple. You fly a spacecraft, which has some thrusters and a lot of mass, and you let the very weak gravitational force of the spacecraft gently tug the asteroid out of its orbit. Or you could nuke it, sort of. In other words, you detonate the nuke next to the asteroid and let its blast ablate the asteroid. That would allow the material to act as a kind of a natural thruster on the asteroid, which could kick it away from us. So there are certainly a number of potentially hazardous asteroids that are out there, and that's why Space Guard and other projects are underway to discover as many asteroids as possible and characterize their orbits.